Our lives are full of journeys, and this is one of mine. I'll tell you right now, nothing extraordinary happens, and I get home safely. But there's a story here anyway. What is it about the American West? It's all those cliches. The new world. Go west, young man. Wide open spaces. The new frontier. Epic landscape. The American dream. I don't remember when Zion first came on my radar. Years ago, possibly pre-internet. The iconic western landscape, and for good reason. It's been the backdrop for scores of movies and television shows from 1924's Deadwood Coach to 2001's Planet of the Apes. And with the Lone Ranger, Lassie, and the outlaw, Josie Wales, thrown in. Notice when you get to disliking someone, they ain't around for long either. So here's the plan. Head out on a Saturday from near the Texas-Louisiana border and drive west. 1,500 miles to Zion National Park. The first day, I didn't even make it out of Texas. Sunday, I burned up some interstate. Miles and miles of America crossing New Mexico and part of Arizona. Across the Colorado River and Glen Canyon, the National Park's indoor observation deck gives a bird's eye view of the Glen Canyon Dam and Lake Powell, the nation's second largest artificial lake. I landed in Kanab, Utah, an hour's drive from Zion. Remember all those movies and TV shows shot here? Well, the Perry brothers marketed Southern Utah as an alternative to Hollywood, and it worked. I stayed at Perry's Lodge, built to cater to the stars. An actual key instead of a key card, basic cable, and a peculiar odor. Welcome to Little Hollywood, baby. Monday's drive took me through the Zion Mount Carmel Tunnel, more than a mile long, it was the longest tunnel of its type when finished in 1930. Its purpose, to connect a series of national parks in the area. The light at the end of the tunnel, Zion Canyon, 15 miles long, half a mile deep, and with an elevation change of 5,000 feet, the Virgin River, fed by snowmelt from the Colorado Plateau, has carved a canyon in the desert. The life-giving waters cascade from the canyon walls, creating microclimates and ecosystems for plants, animals, and people. Several waves of Native Americans farm and hunted Zion Canyon, followed by Mormon pioneers. While the name implies a place of refuge, all found the flash floods and droughts made a difficult life here. The canyon was first put under federal protection in 1909 as a national monument using its Native American name but when the newly formed National Park Service took over the canyon 10 years later, it changed the name to something more easily recognizable, the biblical Zion. Many of the trails were built here in the 20s and 30s, and this one is a classic, the trail to Angel's Landing. It winds for two and a half miles up the canyon with a series of paved switchbacks but it's the last half mile that makes this an unforgettable hike. 
It leads out onto a sandstone spine with a sheer drop off either side. Guide chains assist with the climb. I'll wait here. Okay. And it has the feel of an amusement park ride, both for its thrill and the waiting in line. This 94 year old man is attempting to climb. I passed him and never saw him at the top or on the way back. But an 82 year old successfully made it. The view from Angel's Landing is 360 degrees. It's something to just soak in and to post to Facebook. It's hard not to be in awe of this place and the fact that you work so hard to get here probably cheated death just makes it all that much better. Here's to the victors and the survivors. Better save something for the trip back down. Fifteen years ago, the National Park Service shut off automobile traffic in the upper part of the canyon and put in place a shuttle system. The buses run constantly and you can see much of the canyon without getting out. Zion is among the top ten most visited national parks, almost two and a half million people each year. That's a lot of people in a canyon. This is what's called a front country experience. Lots of water fountains, restrooms, and paved trails. Here in the upper canyon, the walls narrow, leading to a place where the trail leads to the river, and the Virgin River becomes the trail. But that unique hiking experience awaits. It's getting late, and as I'm making my way back in the dark, a park ranger stops me and asks, if I had passed the injured party. I said, no. And with her medical bag in hand, she says, weird. I later heard a river hiker had fallen and injured his face. An ambulance arrived as I waited for the shuttle. Staying in the front country of Zion is as much about interacting with people as anything else. And nowhere is this more evident than on the Emerald Pools Trail. It's family friendly, it's kid friendly, and it's fairly easy, making its way up the canyon to a series of waterfalls and pools. I witnessed dozens of human dramas and heard many languages spoken. Stop kicking your but here we are, in some small way, united by the grandeur of Zion. My final hike of the second day is up the Watchman Trail to watch the sunset. The path gives another view into the canyon as you climb higher and higher and the sun sinks. It's the night of the second presidential debate. I watch the sunset on this national park, listen to the debate on national public radio, and think about what it means to be an American. Watching a sunset means walking back at night. 
It's a darkness that raises a little panic. Watch your step and don't get lost. I spend my three nights at Zion National Park at the South Campground, sleeping in my minivan. No fussing with a tent or sleeping on the ground. Like I said, this was a front country experience. My final hike at Zion took me into the Narrows where the canyon closes in and the river becomes the trail. I rented special equipment, rubber shoes, neoprene socks, and dry pants, waterproof for the rubber gasket that seals the pants at the ankle. I never felt the 51 degree water. Others hiked the river wearing nothing more special than trail shoes. The canyon gives up different views around each corner and plays tricks with the light throughout the day. Time seems to be ever present here, but time on a scale we can't come to terms with. How long did it take for the water to carve this canyon? How persistent must the rushing waters be? You can backpack this trail. Another experience for another day. I left Zion knowing I'd only touched its surface, visited the highlights. I was a tourist on this visit. This would be an entirely different experience to backpack it, to get away from the people and immersed in its landscapes. My journey here is over and I'm headed for home, but not directly home. I was too close to the Grand Canyon not to pay it a visit, so I headed south to the North Rim. It's hard to say anything about the Grand Canyon. Its vastness is overwhelming. Its scale difficult to comprehend. A journey from the rim to river would give some perspective, but not on this journey, not this time. One final stop, and then a dash for home. Meteor Crater near Winslow, Arizona. 50,000 years ago, a meteorite crashed into the desert, creating this impact crater larger than 20 football fields. It's Earth's giant ball of string, one this tourist couldn't pass up. From here, the trip is all downhill, literally back to the Texas coast. I told you in the beginning nothing extraordinary happens and I get home safely. So what is the story? Sometimes it's okay to be a tourist. What was supposed to happen? Live off the land? Well, I did kill a deer. Driving in the Zion the first time, it stopped in the road, too close, eye contact, and then it was over. One journey ends, and another goes on. Then I make one more stop, but I don't know if it counts. A roadside park built around a spring in Tyler County, Texas just far enough from where I live to be a day trip. 
I always stop here given the chance. I'm back in my stomping grounds. And somewhere back there, and for longer than any of us can imagine, is Zion.